Welcome to Medicine Matter Diabetes. I'm Jay Schubert, DO, Professor and Diabetologist at Toro University of California, and I'm joined today by David Strain, MD, who's a Clinical Senior Lecturer in Diabetes and Vascular Preventive Medicine at the Institute of Biomedical and Clinical Sciences at the uh, Peninsula Medical School in Exeter, UK. He's also the head of the academic department um, for healthcare and older adults and the author of the UK 2017 guidelines for the management of older adults with diabetes. We're going to continue our topic today talking about the American Diabetes Association's uh, update on the management of hypertension in adults with diabetes. Well, so we live, uh, so David, welcome, and we're so glad to have you here today. Thank you, Jack. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you. So we have an aging population. You know, it's, I think this is a global phenomenon. We have more and more older adults, and we have older adults with chronic disease. So, you know, what's special about the elderly? Yeah, it's a really interesting point because when we're talking about older adults with diabetes, there are many people who just talk about them as an extension of younger adults. What we forget is the physiological changes that take place between the age of 65 and 80 are actually greater than the physiological changes that children go through in puberty. Now, none of us would consider treating a two-year-old in the same way we treat an 18-year-old, and yet when it comes to older adults, we think nothing about implying the same treatment pathways and the same drugs and the same mechanisms for an 80-year-old that have only ever been tested and validated in our younger populations. So as such, we've got lots of special considerations that we need to think about. The, the, the underlying physiology is fundamentally changed. The responsiveness to external uh, stimuli is also muted, which means exactly the same thing that we do to a, an 80-year-old could have profound effects than compared to what would have happened if we'd have used the same therapy for a 65-year-old. So that's really important. And do we have studies to support how we should treat the elderly differently? Well, the, the very, very few studies. I mean, in, in the whole of diabetes, we know that two-thirds of clinical trials actually um, routinely exclude older adults purely on the basis of their age. If you think of um, Accord, Advance, and VADT, only Accord had no upper age limits. And therefore, actually very often the older patients that we're seeing don't represent the typical manifestations that we see in, in our clinic. There have been a few studies that have looked specifically at older adults, but even in those settings, they tend to use not particularly representative population. An 80-year-old that turns up to a typical clinic tr trial is completely different from the frail, more mature elderly that we see in clinic. And after the age of about 75, actually chronology matters very, very little. Two 80-year-olds can be completely different. One can be still very active, dancing, going to the football, um, whereas another one may be in a nursing home with full dependency. So we have to be very certain that the care that we're offering these individuals will actually benefit them within their anticipated lifespan. So the elderly are really a, a diverse group that have very different presentations and there's little information or imperfect information to advise us on the treatment. Absolutely. I mean, I think you've highlighted that we, we don't have very good, accurate, randomized controlled trials to, to say what we should be doing for these people. And therefore, a lot of what we do is, is opinion. Um, so if, for example, we take the, the SPRINT trial recently conducted with hypertension in older adults, not specific to diabetes, but it was a, a good study looking at hypertension in older adults across the board, and it suggested in that population that there is tremendous benefits that can be achieved from reducing blood pressure. Actually, very similar benefits that we see in the, the younger adults. It has to be, uh, the caveat in that has to be that they don't hit the same targets in the study, but the benefit it did seem to be linear. However, if you go to um, real world data sets, so recently, for example, we've just published our, uh, an analysis of the CPRD based on over a million patients, and that suggests a different picture when you look at the, the general all comers, so including those frail elderly patients, including the ones with multimorbidities, with heart failure or renal impairment or the other problems that are typical 
in a geriatrics service, then those patients actually have, do have a lower threshold. And the threshold seems to be determined more about diastolic blood pressure, which makes a lot of sense really, just from a simple um, overview of it. We spend two thirds of our life in diastole. These patients have had 80 years or so to build up the arterio and atherosclerosis and therefore reduce tissue perfusion. And many of the drugs that reduce systolic blood pressure have an extreme effect on the diastolic blood pressure. And we identified that if you get your diastolic blood pressure dropping below 75 millimeters of mercury, the net result of that is an inadequate perfusion. And so we start to see problems that are not typical blood pressure related problems, but become very apparent and are highly significant nonetheless. So for example, we see rates of dementia will increase with lower diastolic blood pressure. And we tracked back a long way before the, 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 uh, the blood pressure to the incident. So we're not suggesting here that this person has a low blood pressure and they have dementia and those two are interrelated. We track back the diastolic blood pressure over a 10 year period and the, the prognosis for the dementia, for falls, for fractured neck of femur. And all of these plays a big impact in the, the outcomes in our older adults. And of course, the, the first rule of managing people is first do no harm. So we have to be very careful where we're going with our patients and make sure that we end up not over treating them for problems that may not arise. Those are very important points and I think that that's one of the concerns is how much treatment do we actually provide in the elderly, what is too much, what is too little. So with that in mind, what should I expect the, the blood pressure to do as my patient ages? What, is there any generalities? Well, in general, systolic blood pressure rises and diastolic blood pressure falls and this is all caused by the arteriosclerosis, the, the rebound within the aorta, um, which is the, the main call, the main way of maintaining your diastolic blood pressure. Our older adults have got stiffer arteries and therefore they can no longer maintain that diastolic contraction. Now your body's compensatory mechanism therefore is to put the systolic blood pressure up in order to get the same expansion, the same um, the same storage of energy and then you will then get a diastolic push to maintain the diastolic blood pressure at a level that's perfusing the heart and the brain during that vital period. When we are treating therefore this isolated systolic hypertension becomes a condition in its own right and therefore we are looking at a different treatment pro protocol that we see in our younger adults, those under the age of 65, who don't suffer from this isolated systolic hypertension, which has been triggered by the poor compliance as you develop arteriosclerosis. So I should expect more uh, isolated systolic hypertension. Where's the role of the pulse pressure? Is that something I should be looking at in my older, older adults? Well, pulse, pulse pressure and um, isolated systolic hypertension are two things that go hand in hand. I mean, your, your pulse pressure, the difference between systolic and diastole, is basically driven by rising systole and falling diastole blood pressure. And many people will consider that pulse pressure is an alternative way of assessing um, the, the blood pressure. And we see that actually coming from some of the, the recent glycemic studies, that if you take, for example, in the LIDA trial, where systolic blood pressure fell and diastolic blood pressure rose, we actually have a reduction in blood pressure presumably caused by an improvement in arterial compliance, which was in some way a driver towards those beneficial results we see. The converse is true in our elderly patients. Systolic blood pressure fall, gut rises, diastolic blood pressure falls, and we see the huge wave patterns that are causing some of the end organ damage down in the, the small blood vessels. So if I hear you correctly, knowing the challenges of aging in the aging blood vessels, we really should be focusing on making sure we lower the systolic blood pressure, but don't drop the diastolic too low, certainly not below 75. Absolutely, and, and therein lies the, the real difficulty because many of the therapies that we use for our younger adults, the, the main role is to actually reduce the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure falls with them. And there are very few strategies that have got a good evidence base for improving um, arterial compliance.
which is really what we are aiming to do for our older adults. I think one of the best assessments of that was the sub-study of the, the ASCOT blood pressure arm, where they compared the calcium channel blockers and the ACE inhibitors with the beta blocker and thiazide diuretic components. And it demonstrated not only for similar blood pressure results did we get better improvements with the, the newer agents, the calcium channel blocker ACE inhibitor combination, but also on a separate sub-study, the CAFE study, they measured central blood pressure, which is a, another measure of the arterial compliance. And this central blood pressure also improved far more so in the, the newer strategies. And this has left a lot of us to think that maybe we should be approaching the hypertension in those with poorer arterial compliance with the, the newer strategy on calcium channel blockers and the um, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor antagonists. Wow, so really important points today. We talked about the challenges of hypertension in the elderly, the normal physiologic changes, the separation in the systolic and diastolic pressure, all things that we need to be cognizant about when we're treating the person with diabetes and hypertension. In a future session, we're going to get to talk about the nitty-gritty of some of the, the treatment recommendations that you think are best for this population. So I want to thank you for your time today, and thank you for joining Medicine Matters Diabetes. You're welcome, Jay. I look forward to speaking to you again.